Over yeah. overwhelming talent. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. <laughs>
because while I was going to school, I worked for a landscape architect there, and I got my four years that you need to take your license. So I immediately had my license when I graduated. In fact, the story goes that uh, the year I graduated, I, I went to a national convention, a ASLA national convention for the first time. And I received the professional award and the student award <laughs> for a project I had done while I was working in that office. <laughs> so I thought I was ready. <laughs> of course, I landed in New York in 1970. And, uh, and uh, you know, the cities were burning. Uh, New York City was going bankrupt. Uh, uh, the whole idea of public open space in general was, uh, well, it had been stigmatized by the 60s and the 70s to the point where uh, I would have clients that would say, I like all of your ideas. I just don't want you to put any benches. We don't want any people in those spaces. You know, because, you know, it was, you're too young to know what it was like in the 60s and the 70s. It was, for public open space, it was just something you didn't talk about. And of course, the parks in New York City, the Central Park was in shambles. It was, it was a completely different city. And there I was, why did I come here? <laughs> And so slowly I started to just do small little projects, either as a consultant to architects or pro bono projects for community groups, block associations, community boards, you know, non-paying, but good experience in the public process. I'm one of three brothers we, who are all landscape architects. So, my oldest brother, who sort of led me into it, the profession, or over the cliff, depending on which day you talk to me, <laughs> uh, was the, the chief designer, the creative genius behind Paul Freeberg. He's a very talented guy. And when I came to the city, he, two years later, he left Paul Freeberg and he came and joined me. So we became a partnership. Uh, and it only lasted about five years because he was coming from a different culture than I was, a lot of reasons, but uh, we had to part ways. But it was, a, it was a starting off experience for us both to be out there, you know, just trying to, just trying to make a living and finding work. Uh, I think uh, Peter Walker wrote a nice introduction for me. There's a little monograph of my work that he did, and in the introduction, I think he said, how did he say it? He, said, he found the work where there was done. He found corners where there <laughs> didn't exist, right? I was just tenacious about, I'm going to survive. I'm going to find a way, and I'll find work where there is none, even if it's for free. And then I was introduced to the private developer. I was introduced to the, the idea of privately owned public open space. So the city's going bankrupt. The city has no money. Nobody in the city or the public realm cares about public open space. But there's one thing that is constant, and that is developers care about making money. You can always count on that. And this idea of, of bonus plazas, that's what we call it. Are you familiar with that term? Yeah. Mm -hmm. This idea of bonus plazas <coughs> survived the worst of economic times because the developers were always looking to get that bonus. And of course, the way it works, that's a hell of a bonus for that little small gesture that they're doing that. For example, I was the designer for the water wall and the atrium in Trump Tower. I don't consider that to be a very public open space. But the top seven or eight floors of that building, what a bonus. 
What about it's all profit? Because you know all the all the real estate investment costs are already baked into the cake. This is just icing and candles. I understand that the need to make money. I understand what your goals are, and these are my goals. And you, I can enhance your goals if you help me with this. It's got to get approved. So you might as well come on board, and I'll find a way to make sure that this is an amenity for you and your bonus, as well as for the general public. And、uh, because I was able to strike that language, I got I developed really good relationships with city planning, who had to approve the bonus clauses, and、uh, they began to. Respect me because I sort of had my heart in the right place. So those realities are what that was that real world that I was working with when I started doing all these small spaces. And the other beautiful thing about it is that if this is the tower and that's the bonus plaza, that architect is very very busy. He's very busy doing this tower. It's got to be done very fast for money. And he's more than willing not to look at what's going on in the plot. I like that. <laughs> I don't want to collaborate with you. <laughs> I want you to stay inside your walls, and I'm going to stay outside here. This is my my world. And the 50 or 60 plazas that I've done all throughout the city were were all done in that、uh, in that.、Uh, Rare environment of complete independence from architectural meddling, if you will. I started out thinking that they should be、uh, sort of a visually seamless,、ex- uh, a seamless visual experience between the architecture and the ground, because I was taught that in school. Oh, you should integrate the landscape with the architecture. But you know, there's a flip side to that, and that is, in these public open spaces, if the ground level looks, just from a materiality point of view, the same as the building, doesn't that make someone walking by think it's a private space? Isn't that interesting? The way everything we were taught, you can flip it over, and see, oh. There's a problem with that. It's just like when we were doing waterfront parks. We used to always believe, oh, you don't want a street between、uh, the building and the parks, don't you? Want to have get the street out of the way and let there just be a park go by the buildings? No, because then that park begins to feel like it's the people in the building begin to feel like the park. That's their front door, right? We like the street. The street represents a line of public realm, safety, visual sight lines. Good things come with streets, but when I was beginning, the bad streets were bad. So it's it's just interesting over the years how those whole perspectives have changed, or they've been turned upside down by my own experiences, and and I've come to think of things differently. So I I began to with these small little spaces I began to work really hard to make them look totally different from the architecture. Number one because I felt that was a way of saying they were public and a special place, and number two because I wanted to find my own design voice, and that was a that was a perfect way to do it is to base us on the base it on this idea that no this is not an extension of that architecture. Let's say that this was a great public open space. And then you decided to build a building next to it. Why don't we look at it that way? This was the、uh, the proposal when New York City was trying to get the Olympics. This was the Olympic Village site. This end of that master plan, and it was a design competition won by Morphosis,、uh, Tom Main,、uh, and I think Hargraves,、uh, and they did a whole master plan for it. But then they didn't get the Olympics. So, and at the time, 
of the master plan, the property was really owned mostly by state, by the state, not by the city. It's very complicated. It take me too long to explain. The city was involved, but not controlling it. When they went to go after the Olympic Olympics with this site, they had to grab that piece of property from the state, take it back as a city property, and they did the master plan. So when the master plan fell apart, now it's city owned, and the city started thinking, well, what can we do with this? And they committed all of those blocks to be affordable housing. And so another master plan was done to pass all the environmental regulations. And then we were hired because there was sort of an idea of where the park should be, but nothing much more than that. Then we were hired with Arup and Weisman Frady to do a whole new master plan for this and then the final schematic design. So all the schematic designs has been, has been done for this, and it's all been approved with the Public Design Commission, which is very difficult in New York City politically. Once you have that approval, you don't want to go back. There's a certain, there's a certain delicacy to the, that balance where you have to have the public sector and the government and then the private sector. You have to have all these parties trusting you Almost everything about that, that project, I could actually translate it into the politics and the strategy and the, I think my favorite word is the tactics of design in the public realm. The people that want the more natural place and appreciate it don't come out in, in groups and protests. They're the silent ones and we have to fight for them. But the only way we can fight for them is to be tactful about what we're giving. If you went to the west side and you saw the park over at the foot of 23rd Street, there's, there's the whole west side park. There's a piece of it that was done by Van Valkenburg along the river. Across the street is the park called Chelsea Waterside Park, which I did. I did that first. I did it really first for the community as an entire park. Uh, that's why it's called Chelsea Waterside Park, even though it's on this side of the, of the highway. But my strategy for that park was the, the piece on the river should be protected as a passive place. And I'm going to dedicate this piece on this side of the highway as a community park, just filled with activity. There's, there's one space we just finished, you, you might want to see it, it's, it's Astor Place, the 51 Astor, 41 Astor, I can't keep track. It's this little triangular plaza across the street from Cooper Union. Very, very busy intersection. And even though I did it, I would have to say that's one of my favorite places to sit now. Because that's one of those crossroads of the Lower East Side, student population, they're just, it's a crazy place, crazy Alphabet City kids, it's just a crazy place and I could just sit there, I'd rather do that than be in a Broadway musical. <laughs> <laughs> it's much more entertaining and real. You know, when I first came to New York, I would say my fondest experiences in the city were when I had no money and I just sat on ledges and stoops in Greenwich Village and sat for hours just watching urban life, you know. And that would be my favorite place to be in the city, is a place, is like the crossroads. A busy, busy place. It's not a quiet sanctuary garden place. Uh, I don't know for some reason, well maybe it's because I have a weekend home on the sea. I get that there. But I love, I love the surprise and the discovery of, of urban life that just unfolds in front of me. I, I celebrate the city. I inhale mm -hmm. the city. A lot of people are here, you know, because 
for one reason, for their job or whatever, and they're, they get any, any opportunity they can, they go and escape it. Now, I'd love to, I'd love to take the train over and go over here and sit along in Gantry Plaza State Park. But that's not my first thought. My first thought is to get out there and see the people. Every, to me, a place is defined by the people, not by the plants. I'm sorry, but <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm a people-centric person, and I'm not a plant-centric person. So the first thing I think about when I'm designing a public open space is people. 